Now, welcome back to my state of mind, Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee, talking about the stimulus money that the governor is holding back to plug the state budget. He thinks that money ought to be used to put into the business community. Specifically, Dan, what would you do? Uh, what, what would the program be for grant money out of the $1.25 billion for businesses? How would that work? So I got, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting two different strategies, one on the grants, one on loans. I'll talk quickly about, the, about both the grant comes out of the federal money uh, is specifically for businesses that have not uh, have been uh, forced to close and not been allowed to operate. Uh, that's what it says in the guidelines. What you would do is you would allocate a, a certain amount of money uh, and, and then distribute it over a certain amount of months uh, and then have businesses that have been required to close apply for those dollars. You implement a math formula and then you distribute money to every one of those businesses in one form or another. Any dollar that comes into those businesses around Dan right now are going to be appreciated both psychologically and also financially. So that's the way that I would see that. Those dollars distributed, pick a, pick a dollar, $100 million, distribute it over a four-month time frame. I have businesses that we had forced to close uh, to keep us safe, uh, apply for those dollars, create a metric, and then distribute those dollars uh, amongst uh, thousands, you know, a couple thousand businesses uh, now you're going to help the you're going to help the economy. How does that how does that interact with the PPP and the unemployment and all that kind of thing? Well, I think it's very clear in the in the guidelines, Dan, that it's for businesses that have been required to close. So any business that was required to close during since COVID started, they would they would qualify for those dollars. Businesses that didn't were, weren't required to close. They wouldn't require. They wouldn't. They wouldn't qualify for those dollars based on the guidelines. So you would be very specific, and then you would. All you need is, uh, you know, I've done this on many occasions as a mayor. You get an actuary, you do the work, you create the formula, and then you distribute it. Unlike uh, some other funds that are, uh, you know, that the, the supply didn't meet the demand. No, distribute these dollars out to anyone who qualifies uh, in a way that you know that they get a piece of the pie. Everybody gets a piece of the pie and helps out, and that helps them. So t talk to me about the banking side, because you yeah. also mentioned that in addition to grant money direct to businesses that were forced to close during COVID-19 phasing, you also want to see a grander state guarantee program with, with the banks. What, what is that all about? Yeah, and you qualify all the small businesses, whether it's 50 and under employees or wherever the metric is, but really focus on the small businesses. A state guarantee uh, with the banks and, and partnering with all the banks. Uh, to have them do their part as well with an aggressive uh, loan strategy, maybe a 10 to one type of uh, you know, a, a ratio where the, the state puts $100 million up in guarantees that, and the banks lend out uh, up to a billion dollars uh, to credit where the uh, businesses that choose to borrow to keep their business alive. I thought it was really interesting on a call on Friday with Mark Haywood from the SBA when I was describing this program. He says, you know, I've been asking for years for to have a combination of a state guarantee, the SBA, he felt, actually could come in and piggyback on a state guarantee so it would even make it even more favorable for the small business and the loan. So now there's another option just by talking about it, having you and have been on, have me talk about it. Now the SBA is saying, why don't we explore that idea of actually piggybacking an SBA guarantee on top of the, on, on, on top, in addition to a state guarantee and go to the banks and then have them manage a local portfolio of small business loans over the next two years. It would be very, very helpful to these businesses. As a small business owner myself, I can make the decision whether or not that those dollars borrowed today make sense because I protect myself in the future and I have a business sitting there where maybe if I don't have those dollars, I'm out of business in a short period of time and never, never recovering. So yeah, the combination of a grant strategy that I'm proposing and a loan strategy that I'm proposing uh, would be very beneficial to small businesses. And based on my experience as a, as a business person, as a, as a mayor, uh, working with nonprofits the way I have, and now as a general officer, and in my thousands of interactions over the last few weeks, last several weeks with small businesses, I know that this would be very helpful to everybody in the state of Rhode Island, including this economy. Well, look, uh, the uh, the loan guarantee program, I, I think, is uh, is it's got to be looked at. This discrepancy or this different the difference of opinion between you and the governor has got to be reconciled. Only have a minute here. Are, are are you are you able to, you know, are you able to connect with her and 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 sit down at the table and just say, hey, look, look, we we disagree, but let me make an argument. If if, if we don't take the designated money from the feds to do what the feds say to designate it for. 
and, and sustain these closed businesses uh, that are now beginning to reopen, perhaps, we're not going to have a state budget to save. Are, 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 are you able to make that argument to her directly or indirectly um, ASAP? Yeah, so we had, we had, like I said, on that March 12th letter and the, and the phone message and the, and the text I left for the governor, we certainly are available. We said that we are. We've been instructed to work with their staff. That's what we're doing, and we're communicating this. So the idea is there, and our offer to assist and help in any way possible and use my expertise to help out is sitting there as well, and it's the governor's choice to determine what to do. I understand that, and, uh, but I, it's my responsibility as an office holder in the state of Rhode Island to make people aware that these options exist. Okay, um, we'll, uh, we'll check back in. It's, a, it's an urgent request, and uh, uh, I ho hopefully the argument has been heard. Um, appreciate your work on this, uh, Lieutenant Governor, and uh, we'll check back with you as, uh, as soon as events warrant. Thanks, Dan. Okay, you bet. And so we shall continue to follow this discrepancy and see where it goes. Oversight is necessary. Oversight is necessary. You have a great evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'll talk to you tomorrow. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Well, good evening and welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. This is Wednesday evening, June 3rd on the original broadcast and perhaps uh, beyond as we um, bring you original state of mind broadcast now in week three. It is a uh, gradual recovery for all of us and We'll be on a same-day basis uh, down the line, and we'll let you know when we can be. We actually recorded this show just a couple of days ago, but this is an original conversation coming up with Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee, who has appeared on the broadcast prior. The reason I'm bringing him back here this evening is that there's a clear discrepancy going on between the governor and the lieutenant governor in terms of uh, funding for businesses here in the state of Rhode Island. The federal government has a stimulus program, a $1.2 billion stimulus check that they sent to Rhode Island as part of the 50 state COVID-19 response. And in it, there's a directive to send money to small businesses who have been closed and affected by the virus. The governor has transparently said that she's holding a bunch of that money back in case she has to plug the state budget with it. And there's a philosophical disagreement over this that I think you'll find interesting. So when we come back, Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee on his point of view on this here on My State of the States. To my state of mind on this Wednesday evening. This is a program that we recorded on Monday afternoon. The Dan York state of mind is all over the place. We are we are doing what we can to put our television programs together on an original basis. Um, this is an off week for me on the radio, and so uh, bear with us. Timing uh, it may not be exact on on some things in the news cycle, but concepts are pretty consistent here. And tonight we are going to talk to you about uh, the progress that has been made by both the Raimondo administration and Lieutenant Governor, who has been really working hard on the business side of this. A discrepancy uh, on the stimulus money that is going to impact the business community significantly and, you know, where we're going uh, from here. We're now in phase two, of course, and uh, that brings us a little bit of a little bit of return to normalcy. Uh, my guest uh, for this evening is Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee. He rejoins me uh, from a few weeks ago. Uh, Governor, good to see you. Thank you very much for checking in with us. Well, thank you for the invitation, Dan. Appreciate it. Phase two, uh, the governor has uh, brought restaurants back in, in, in house dining up to 50%. Uh, travel restrictions, I think, are, are finally being relaxed here, which of course, is a real pleasure for things like golf courses for you know for only one example something that i know you've been working on um we're back into the the hairstyling business i know uh, i just got one i don't know did you got did, did you get one yet because you've been yeah. uh, 
you've been up there a little bit. Dude. Now I start getting up. I, I guess slicking it back right now. I gotta. I got. I gotta, I'm gonna wait a couple more days. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's, so we we know what's going on here with the phase two. Uh, the heartbreak is that nursing homes can't be visited, hospitals can't be visited, at least for COVID patients. And there's a whole bunch of uh, the stuff still to come. But do you feel uh, do you feel a sense of progress here with phase two? I think that, yeah, I think that we have had progress, and I think that the state of Rhode Island has done a, a very good job uh, positioning us so that we're. Where our reopening is is happening, uh, you know, at a faster pace than than our bordering states. And uh, from that point of view, I think that it's good for our economy. But there's a lot of challenges built in because of all of the time that the businesses have not been allowed to operate uh, during the last 60, 70 days. So, but the guidelines are still restrictive. Uh, but I think that with good um, management, uh, the businesses are going to be able to do a 50%. Uh, on the restaurants, uh, they're going to be at the tourism, as you mentioned, with a 14-day quarantine. Very big for our tourism, for our hotels, for our, the people who are renting vacation homes, and all the you know all the economy that results as a direct result of people coming from out of state and vacationing into our into our state. So I think June 1st, uh, with that activation, is a is, is going to allow the uh, our tourism to uh, function. Uh, certainly not profitably, but they're going to be able to function. And I think that's what the name of the game is right now, Dan, is to just make sure these small businesses have a fighting chance. And, and, the, and the June 1st uh, time frame for reopening on phase two is giving many of our businesses that fighting chance. So, so let's talk a little bit about, about uh, some of the, the nitty gritties of the progress. I mean, we can go backwards first and, and, and talk about what you've been doing on the side. Clearly, the governor has... Uh, all the attention in terms of her briefings, and again, I, I think everybody gives her ter terrific credit on on the health issues, the director of health, the, uh, the the lowering of the curve. I mean, there's a lot of stuff uh, that the governor has had to deal with, and has uh, is, has done a pretty exceptional job. Um, she has not been uh, one to acknowledge much of the work that you have been doing, but uh, formally at least. But on behind the scenes. It's apparent that the administration recognizes what the lieutenant governor's office has been doing because you had members of the administration working with you on, on FaceTime and the original conference calls and uh, all that kind of a thing. It began kind of with, uh, you know, everyone jumping on a scratchy conference call and evolved from a pretty high-tech conference call all the way into FaceTime. And uh, you've, you've, you've actually highlighted sectors of the businesses uh, one by one to, to bring them into orientation on PPP and uh, all of that. Tell me, tell me about what went on there and, and what successes you, you can Yeah, uh, let's go back to March 12th. Uh, and I think that it's important for people to realize that we have been, uh, we have reached out to the governor's office. I wrote a letter on March 12th uh, that indicated that our office was very willing to uh, participate in any level. Uh, left her a phone message on March 13th and a, and a text message on March 13th saying the same thing. So the directive that we got was to work with her staff and that's what we've been doing. So I just want to make sure it's very clear that our office uh, has reached out and has had made ourselves available. Uh, I think some of the comments that, the, uh, that were made uh, Friday at the governor's press conference indicated that maybe we were feeling left out, we're certainly not feeling left out. We're right in the middle of, of the mix and we're following the direction that we were given to work with the department heads, as you said. So we've, we've transferred uh, our small business uh, that I chair the Small Business Advocacy Committee, and we've transferred that into thousands of contacts uh, through, the, through this, a venue like this, Dan, right? And we bring, we bring it on the SBA with Mark Haywood, we're bringing on the DLT uh, with, uh, that's the Department of Labor Training on the unemployment issues. With Mark Weldon, uh, Liz Tanner from the Department of Business uh, Regulation has been on, and we've brought on businesses as well, reps, senators, our congressional leaders. Uh, I think that we've had, we probably have had reached, and on just those phone calls alone, uh, we're averaging about 30,000 reaches a week on those on those broadcasts. So you do that over 10, 12 weeks, we've had three, four hundred thousand contacts, you know, over and over again about delivering the message of what our office is doing. The other one that I would ask the people to do it, listen to it. If you if you you know you're questioning what we might be doing or you want to know, go to our website. We've we've listed every single activity that we've been involved in on our website and our press and our press releases, 
and working with the businesses you and working with you dan and other 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 media outlets helping our garden shops helping our restaurants on the beer and wine and the takeout helping our our, our hair salons helping our fitness centers met Met with a fitness center owner last week. Uh, went actually inspected, and he's going. To, they're going to be opening up this week, and they got to do all the social distancing. But we were able to kind of make sure that um, that everybody knew, including the governor's staff, uh, the things that we're working on, and uh, the importance of restarting our economy and protecting our small businesses. Okay, good, good. So that's a good overview. So when when, when we come back, uh, I want to talk about a very important financial piece that is is clearly um, being evaluated differently between the governor and lieutenant governor's office and and what the small business community uh, might be aching for out there in terms of cash infusion right back on dan york state of mind lieutenant governor dan mckee statements welcome back to my state of mind lieutenant governor dan mckee is my guest now that we're in phase two we uh, we have some interesting uh, developments here the $1.25 billion, uh, Dan, that uh, was made available by the federal government in terms of stimulus, uh, the $1.25 to the state as part of the 50-state stimulus, is really interesting. If I understand it correctly, it has prescribed in, in it a, a, a mandate for the money to be used to, to rescue businesses that have been infa- impacted by COVID-19. Governor Raimondo is holding back hundreds of millions of dollars in that budget uh, or in that stimulus fund for uh, the chance that she may be allowed to use it to balance the state budget. Right now, uh, she's hedging her bet that she can have that waiver and I guess worried that there won't be any more stimulus to come after the $1.25 billion. So she thinks that she's being conservative and smart with, with the money. You have made a very, very vocal case that the money needs to be used for what it was prescribed for and needs to get into the business community immediately. Can you talk to me about the difference in perspective? Yeah, so the guidelines uh, of the dollars that you just described, the CARES dollars, the federal dollars that came to the state to help on COVID-19 issues, um, it's very clear that dollars in that, uh, on those requirements can be used towards businesses that have been required to close. Uh, so on a policy issue, I believe that the, the dollars should be released aggressively to those, bu- those small businesses. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense to me because if we want to have an economy to help the state you know, pay its bills, we need to save our businesses. And if we don't save our small businesses, there's going to be an economic collapse of, of our small businesses, which are going to result in terms of lack of revenue coming into the state. So my belief is that there's many other areas that the uh, the guidelines can can, can uh, you know be uh, dollars could be allocated to, but I would think that the small businesses would be a, a, a an important piece and a high priority when you consider everything that the small businesses provide and allowing the small businesses to. Uh, get some of these dollars and uh, psychologically it's important to them it's also important they've got startup costs those businesses have not been able to open up we have we have um right now uh hair salons barber shops uh and other gyms that are uh, restaurants that are absorbing costs because of the COVID 19. those are costs that all could be uh helped out with these dollars i think that it's really important that the public knows that and so when I was saying earlier in the interview that I don't feel left out because we're right in the middle of what is going on, because of our interaction that we have, we're discovering things that are really important to share with the general public. I believe that needs a great deal, a great deal more oversight and 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 um, spotlight on uh, on those dollars and how those dollars are used. And up to now, uh, it has been uh, it hasn't been as transparent as it needs to be. And I don't think that people under- really fully understand that those dollars could be allocated into different communities, including the small businesses. Uh, that really makes a lot of sense right now at this critical time. So, so the oversight thing is interesting. The The Republicans in the House have been trying to get the House Oversight Committee uh, to get into the game on nursing home review and the like. The COVID-19 task force has been uh, ad hoc formed by the Senate and the House is this, you know, this unicameral joint commission, which has no effect of law. The Finance Committee of the House is meeting and scratching out budget numbers, but um, we've got 
look, the elephant in the room in the General Assembly has always been that a handful of people make the decisions anyway. I think that's becoming really apparent uh, and, and transparent of how bad it, it really goes anyway. In other words, just a confirmation of what has been long time culture. But your, your transparency uh, conversation is a little bit different. You're talking about the specificity of the use of the, 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 the stimulus money, uh, something that this, by the way, COVID task force should have honed in on, and maybe they ought to be reforming to take a look at this whole thing, because um, if I hear you correctly, you disagree with the governor on a practical use of hundreds of millions of dollars to get into the, into the checking accounts of businesses that have had to close. She's holding back money and admits it that she's holding back money because she's worried there isn't going to be more stimulus. Um, what, is your, what, what, what is your argument against that? What, what are you saying? Uh, that, that if we don't put money into the businesses, there's not going to be a state budget to protect anyway? I mean, is it that dramatic? Yeah, well, that's what I was saying earlier, just a few sentences ago. Look, at there's, an, there's a value to the small businesses, not only to the families and the, and the people who are employed by them, but it, it, it's that they're, they're fundamental in terms of balancing our local uh, municipal budgets and our state budgets, right? With the tax revenue that comes in, sales tax, the, uh, the meals tax, the uh, hotel taxes, uh, the payroll taxes, uh, the unemployment taxes. Uh, so if we have failures in our businesses, We'll have more unemployment, put more pressure on our unemployment fund, less revenue coming into the state. That's why I'm saying that we, we really should be setting priorities and, and, and uh, you know, putting first what needs to be first, supporting our small business. And, that, and then you find out we have the ability to do it, Dan. And most people don't know that. Most people don't know because we haven't really put a spotlight on how those federal dollars could be used. Uh, and this week we'll be talking about a couple other things, focusing today with you on the small business issue. But we should be putting money into other other communities out there that are being really impacted by by the virus, and we have the ability to do it. So we shouldn't be rationing those dollars. We should be aggressively getting those dollars on the street. As those dollars come out into the small business community or other communities, those are the monies that are get spent in the communities. Those are the monies. Those dollars. That, that's part of the economy. That's part of the way that we can keep. Uh, you know, our economy alive. And boy, it's going to be a challenge if, in fact, a lot of small businesses fail in the state of Rhode Island. The impact, the just the emotional impact on those families and the people who work there is going to be dramatic. But the economic impact, if we don't really support them. And what is troubling is the fact that we do have dollars that the federal government gave us for this specific purpose. Let's use those dollars. Okay, so when we come back on Dan York State of Mind with Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee, I want to hear him specifically talk to us about if uh, you know if, if he could make if he could make the directive on this money, how would he use it? And how would the banking community participate as well? Right back with our final segment with Lieutenant Governor on that matter. Stay with us on Dan York State of Mind.